Welcome back as we continue our investigation on why sleep is so important. This morning we looked at the pineal gland and the importance of going to bed early so that we access those nightly hormones, those rest and rejuvenate nighttime hormones. It also explains why healing happens at almost twice the rate while we're sleeping. But I'd like to look at another aspect of sleep and why it is so important. And believe it or not, the information I'm going to share with you now, I got from a man, I read a book called Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker. Dr. Matthew Walker is a neurologist and an incredible amount of information we found in this book. And I believe that God led me there. This man is an atheist, but what's incredible is in the book he says it's almost as if sleep has an intelligence <laughs> because of what he discovered about sleep. Now, the first research regarding what I'm going to share with you now was done in about the 1950s. They were doing it on rats, and they found that there were times in the night where the eyes moved rapidly and there were times in the night where the eyes were not moving rapidly at all. In fact, they were almost still. They also found that when the eyes moved rapidly, the brain was moving rapidly. When the eyes were still, the brain was fairly still. And they found that it happened in cycles. So then they moved on to humans. In fact, one of the researchers even did it on his little two-year-old girl while she slept. And they found that it was all, almost universally the same. And they called the time where the eyes moved rapidly, rapid eye movement time. So we'll call it REM. And when the eyes were slow and the brain was slow, non-rapid eye movement time. And as they looked at what happened in the brain at these times, and I guess many experiments and electrodes that they had connected showed them these things, they found that in rapid eye movement time, there's a filing system happening. And this filing... Dr. Matthew Walker said, it's just incredible. The filing is an orderly filing. It's happening in order. That's where he said sleep. It's almost as if it has an intelligence. And the filing has a lot to do with what happened through the day, but it brings up the past and that's where the dreaming happens. So it's in rapid eye movement time where a lot of dreaming happens. And he came to the conclusion that the dreaming, bringing back a whole lot of things from the past, that it, uh, it helps with the filing. In rapid eye movement time, this is where you get a consolidation of what you've been learning through the day. And this is where inventions happen. And when I studied this, I could really identify with this. My father and my one brother, who is two and a half years older than me, are inventors. And I think there's a little bit of that in me because of the different things that, that I come up with in my mind. And it always happens in rapid eye movement time. So what's happening in non-rapid eye movement time? In non-rapid eye movement time, there's a courier system happening. What's the courier system? We need to look at the brain to understand this. So here's the brain from side on. The whole top of the brain is called the cortex. There's the cortex. And probably around here, in the base of the brain, somewhere in here, is the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus is our short-term memory department. So everything that's happening through the day is stored in the short-term memory unit. That's short-term memory unit, which is the hippocampus. <coughs> Not sure whether it's us or is. 
I think it's S. Yes. Yeah. Go back to the U. Yeah. Now up the top, right in the middle of the, co of the cortex, there's the long-term storage unit. And so in non-rapid eye movement time, there's a courier system that is taking the memory from the short-term memory unit up to the long-term storage unit. And this is very important that this be emptied through the night so that the next day you've got a, an empty storage unit for the day's memories. In non-rapid eye movement time, there's a cleaning system. So what has to be cleaned up? The waste from neuronal activity, waste from the combustion of glucose and oxygen in the cell, and it appears what happens is the nerve cells shrink up a bit to allow more fluid between the cells. And the system that does the cleaning is the glymphatic system. And the glymphatic system is made up of glial cells. So the glial cells are more numerous than even ner nerve cells. So they do the cleaning at night. It's almost like what happens in the cities at night. You know, the cleaners come out and clean the streets. Yeah. But what is also interesting about the cleaning system is that it also can clean up negative emotions. But the only way it can clean up the negative emotions is if we've made the decision to forgive mm -hmm. and allow God to take our trials. That's why he says to he says in Matthew 10, 31, Come unto me, all you that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Interesting that when we rest at night, the glymphatic system can take that away. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Beautiful verse that we know so well. But look at it in relation to rapid eye movement and non-rapid eye movement time. So that's your cleaning system. Now I'd like to show you how they work, how they work <laughs> together. So we're going to look at non-rapid eye movement time <coughs> and where it works and we're going to look at rapid eye movement time. And this is happening in 90 minute cycles. So let's let's have a look at 9 to 5. What Dr. Matthew Walker showed, and a lot of research he has up his sleeve in his book to show this, 8 hours. Not negotiable. Earlier in our studies this week, I did mention Dr. Matthew Walker and I did mention how the university asked him to do a paper to help with students and he said not, eight hours not negotiable. And when you look at the pineal gland and the role it plays, so we've got a choice. It can be 8 p.m. to 4 a.m., it can be 9 to 5, it can be at a stretch in the summer 10 to 6 a.m. Aren't you glad that God gives us a choice? Mm -hmm. There's your choices. So let's do 9 to 5. So we're doing 9 p.m. to 10.30. What they found is that the rapid eye movement and the non-rapid eye moon movement, they work together in 90-minute cycles. So there's our first... 90 minute cycle and in the first part of the night non-rapid eye movement takes up 80% of the time and rapid eye movement takes up 20%. As we move through the night now we're coming from 10.30 to 12 midnight. From 
10.30 to 12 midnight, the second set of 90 minute cycle, we have 60% non-rapid eye movement and 40% rapid eye movement. And then we come from midnight to 1.30. From midnight to 1.30, we've got about 50-50. 50, 50. 50 non-rapid eye movement time, 50 rapid eye movement time. Moving on from 1.30 to 3. From 1.30 to 3 a.m., we've got 40% non-rapid eye movement and 60% rapid eye movement. And then from three to five, our last two hours, we've got 20% non-rapid eye movement and we've got 80% rapid eye movement time. As he shows in his book, Why We Sleep, Dr. Matthew Walker quotes many research papers from all over the world that have confirmed what I'm showing you here. But this tells us so much, so much. So if someone goes to bed at midnight, they can wake up in the morning, even if they wake up at 8 a.m. And their short-term memory unit hasn't fully emptied which means they can't take in as much memory of the things that are happening in the day. They've missed out on a, not all their cleaning system, but they've missed out on a percentage of their cleaning system. And then we go over to the pineal gland, they're not getting their full dose of serotonin or epithalamin or arginine vasotocin or melatonin. Can you see the importance of sleep? Dr. Matthew Walker quotes studies where they had 20 students and they all were in class learning the same thing. This is in university, so they're 18 and above. And 10 of the students had six hours sleep a night. <coughs> the other 10 had eight hours sleep a night. After three months, the research showed that the eight hours sleep a night they, they retained about 50% more than the six, six hours sleep a night. Now, if you've had four hours sleep a night, you know it. <laughs> but if you have six hours, you feel okay. So six hours sleep is a great deception. He says 10, hour, ten nights of six hours sleep a night, 50% less cognitive performance that's brain, 50% less physical performance. Whew. Isn't that incredible? I used to think six hours was fine. I felt okay. After reading this book, no. So I just had to work out hard to get out of my chat room because <laughs> that's the thing that would keep me awake, yeah? I have a question. If you move from one country to another country, um, then you have other times there. That's so right. how long do you need to adapt? I find that you can adapt within about three or four days. So when I go from one country to another country, I immediately live those times mm -hmm. in that country. And if I'm falling asleep, <laughs> I'll, I won't let myself. The only thing I will let myself do is at about 10 or 11 in the morning, I will allow myself a half hour nap. And I mentioned yesterday when we looked at sun, I find that the sun resets your circadian rhythm. It, it sets it incredibly fast. Remember sitting in the sun and, and closing your eyes and letting the sun go through your eyes. So when I come from Australia, and that's, if you go to Dallas, you're 15 hours on the plane mm -hmm. and then another about five hours to Minneapolis. And then I find it very hard to sleep on the way over. And then I um, usually sleep very well the first night because you're so tired, but it's the next night. Mm 
<laughs> so I get my little grandbaby and sit out in the sunshine. They keep you awake. <laughs> Put my head up, let the sun go on my eyes and then open my eyes. And I have been traveling to visit my daughter. My daughter has been living in the US for 22 years. And the first few years, it would be almost two weeks before I could sleep at night. I'd be just falling asleep through the day. If I wake in the night, I put the light on and read. I do not do that anymore. But that is one thing a person can do if they cannot sleep and they're, they're really struggling. They can put just a night light on and read, but make sure it's a boring book. <laughs> Nothing exciting. The life habits of the Australian platypus. <laughs> but something that's not too exciting. That don't get a spy, a spy one, or, or uh, don't read The Long Walk. <laughs> of these three people who had that long walk, yes? Do you also change your routine directly for daylight saving also? Um, yeah, yeah. But I find I live in the country, so in, when you're in the country, you always go to bed earlier in the winter. So I wake up in the winter in Australia, it's pitch black and I'm, it's almost like the switch has turned. I'm awake and I'm ready to go <laughs> at 5am in the morning and it's pitch black, pitch black outside. All through the day, our body goes through cannibalism. You've heard of cannibalism? It's the breaking down, the breaking down and giving energy. And you've probably heard of metabolism. Yes. So metabolism basically is the, the rate of, that the body runs at and your thyroid gland controls metabolism. So cannibalism, and I know in... I know in, ah, uh, oh, that's catabolism. Sorry, <laughs> we're not eating people. <laughs> ah, my brain was telling me there's something terribly wrong here. <laughs> so catabolism and anabolism. <laughs> yes, I'm not suggesting we eat each other. So what, so anabolism is the building up and catabol, cat, catabolism is the breaking down. It's interesting in um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 where it says to every, se to every season there is a purpose and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to break down and a time to build up. <laughs> so the, the breaking down happens all through the day as we move, as the body is supplying fuel. And then at night is the anabolism. Everything's building up. In my anatomy and physiology book for nursing, there are these little men that are, are pulling down a building in the day and there are these same little men building it up <laughs> while we sleep at night. So basically when the building up has completed, you wake up. We are the only creature on the planet that uses an alarm clock. And when you wake up to an alarm clock, it's not a good wake. <laughs> I think we all know it. So basically that determines we wake up. So again, you go to your eight hours sleep a night. I'm not sure about this alarm clock. I heard the, the, the cock. So I think the hen is... Ah, the, the rooster. rooster. <laughs> I remember saying to my son James when he was two, he used to breastfeed at night, and I said, no more feeding at night. You can feed when the rooster crows. That's when I discovered they can crow at 2 a.m. <laughs> so I had to change it <laughs> when the sun gets up. 
No, we wouldn't be doing that in Sweden. We'd have to think of something else because the sun <laughs> gets up at 4 a.m. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's also there are habit patterns. And I'm going to show you tomorrow how you can change your habits. You can rewire your brain. And I touched on it, I think it was yesterday, 21 days to form a new habit, 60 days, and it is in cement. So you can train yourself into longer sleep. And that's what I had to do. And I have trained myself since reading the book into longer sleep. So I average seven and a half to eight hours every night. So there are many people who aren't living life to their fullest. Isn't that true? They're not living life to their fullest because of lack of sleep. It's a huge problem today. And when you present this sort of information, the person goes, ah, now I understand. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy to him that understands. So the enemy of souls, the great deceiver that has deceived the whole world, the roaring lion who walketh about seeing whom he can devour, what's he going to deceive us into doing? Missing out on our sleep. That's right. Now remember I've also quoted a little passage from Steps to Christ where the writer said, it's not the odd day you do it and it's not the odd day you don't. It's your habitual daily de tendency that determines character. And it's exactly the same with health. It's not the odd day you do it and the odd day you don't. It's your habitual daily tendency. So when I flew to Sweden, I had to get up at half past two in the morning to get to the airport by four o'clock to catch a 6 a.m. flight. And I was very glad I did because I was in the lineup to check in for over an hour. <laughs> but the point of me telling you this is that I hadn't had much sleep. I think I almost dozed off a couple of times in the plane, but that's not a very comfortable sleep. So that night I slept for 11 hours. <laughs> I was very glad to be able to sleep for 11 hours. If you miss out on sleep, can you catch up? No, you can't. You actually can't. Yes? I'm thinking of people who are working at night. Would That's it right. suffice to sleep in advance? So people who are sleeping at night, what do they do? Because someone's got to sleep at night. The research is showing that people who have continually, you know, sleepless nights like that, who work at night, that has a similar effect on their body to drug addiction and alcoholism. But someone's got to do night duties, that's true. So I, my suggestion is, especially for the nurse, for the doctors, that do as, as less shifts as you can. And also play with those pineal gland secretions. So when I was a nurse, we had three shifts in the 24 hours. We had... Um, 7 to 3, 3 to 11, and then 11 to 7 in the morning. So if I have um, 11 to 7 in the morning, what I can do is go to bed about 6 p.m. and wake up at 10.30. So can you see I've got a little chunk there? And then when I come home from work, go straight to bed there and have a little chunk there. And then be up in the middle of the day so maybe break up the eight hours into those two, four hours and then have the sun in the day and exercise in the day. And eat, when would you eat your main meals? A lot of people that do night duty eat their meal as soon as they get home. No, go straight to bed. Go straight to bed. And so your breakfast you would have maybe uh, at midday. And then you might have a light meal just before you go to bed at 6 p.m. to get that other four hours in and then have a meal at work. So if I'm doing the 11 till 7 a.m. shift, I might have a, a meal at midnight. So you'd play with it like that. And make sure you do a nice exercise. When would you do your exercise? 
I think the best time to do the exercise would be after your four hours from uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, eleven. Say you wake at eleven a.m. You do a, a workout then, and then have a meal at um, at, at midday. We had. Um, you might have heard of Botany Bay. That's where our big uh, Sydney airport is. It's on a bay. It's where Captain Cook first landed at Botany Bay. We had uh, Australia's top mariner do our program. So here's a man that works every night uh, guiding boats in and out of Botany Bay. And he was very interested in this, especially the pineal gland secretions because what he would do is he'd come home and have a big meal in, in the morning and he'd also do a workout um, you know, at another time in the day and then someone told him, no, don't exercise, you'll sleep better. But he was really glad to hear this. You see, when you present this, the person automatically is making out their own program. They're automatically looking at how, how can I fit this into my day? How, how can I do this? So it's having solutions for, for people who, who do this. So then we apply this to the true remedies. Again, pure air, you sleep better. Sunshine in the day, remember that's help resetting your body clock. And temperance, that's ta not taking anything into the body that will harm it and taking in moderation the good things, which we're going to be looking at when we come back at in our next break and this and this is what Dr. Matthew Walker found and this is what he wrote in his article to the students for the university paper he said don't have any alcohol don't have any caffeine don't have any refined sugar go to bed early an exam should be stretched out maybe two a week well they didn't get him to write that again the, the authorities did did not like his paper and yet how many students um, study till one in the morning? And how many are taking coffee to try and keep awake? Can you imagine the quality of the results in, of these papers if, if this was taken on? Yeah, can I ask? Yeah, when we were studying to become teachers in psychology of education, we were taught that it's not good for students to study up to the last minute for the mm -hmm. exams because it can happen that you and they forget. That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. And I know Professor Walter Weith, he's, when he was teaching he, at exam time, he said, I don't want anyone to come into my exam room if they're having Coke or coffee mm -hmm. because, he's, because it stimulates to the point where the person thinks that they're they're going to do really good in the exam, but then you get the corresponding dump and they, they don't know where they are. So that's of the utmost importance. Of course, we're look so the, the stimulants, they definitely interfere with sleep, so that's a big contributing factor why people aren't sleeping well. Exercise, not many people exercise today. And what I maintain is we are, we are training for something more important than the Olympic Games. And if you look at the training session that the uh, Olympian athletes go through, whew, they can't afford a late night. They, they can't afford to have a drink. I know in Australia there was this promising young uh, swimmer. He'd, he'd won all the trials in Australia. He was going to the Olympic Games and it was a Friday night and he went out with his mates and got drunk and he king hit. I think king hit means punch someone straight in the face and, and the guy passed out. Well, that made headlines. Ooh. And he lost everything. Oh, he, he would go to court, he'd be in his best clothes and pleading, pleading could he have his place. You know, all his life he'd been working to, to get a place in the Olympic Games and he just lost it. Just totally lost it. You know, one one wrong act that just cannot be cannot be undone. What what a difference that can make. And so right now, we give our body all the conditions. And when someone's under the influence of alcohol, they're they're not thinking clearly. 
They're not thinking clearly at all. It certainly is the devil's brew. So one wrong, wrong act can, can spoil so much in our life. And so right now today, God wants us to implement and give our bodies the conditions for healing. And people often say exercise is a forgotten remedy. And I, I, think, I think so, but I think sleep is also the forgotten remedy. This is one area where I get resistance from many people. So I'm so thankful for the book Why We Sleep, Matthew Walker. You can put in Matthew Walker, Dr. Matthew Walker, and, and you get little podcasts by him. He's a very well-spoken Englishman. I think he's late 40s, 50. And, uh, he, and what he draws people in with the first that you through few things he usually says is for men and their sexual performance. And you know, in the world today, that always gets everyone interested. But yeah, that's affected by sleep and by lack of sleep. Yes? I think also uh, lack of sleep uh, helps to, to get mental challenges, is it right? Absolutely. Yeah. So 10 nights of six hours sleep a night, 50% less cognitive performance. So that's your, your mental performance. So absolutely your... Your thoughts, thought patterns can start spiralling down. God's work is suffering because the saints are sick. Isn't that true? So it's of the utmost importance we get our bodies not only ready for uh, so we can have better life, but also so God's work has, has workers. So when I first went to... Um, couple of the health retreats in America, I just couldn't believe how overworked the staff were. Now, if the guests see overworked, tired staff, that's not a very good illustration. In 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3, it says, Ye are our epistles, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You know what the guests want to see? They want to, what they want to see, they want to see these laws in action. And what I found was everyone was there early in the morning. Everyone there was late at night. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> at our retreat, we've got the exercise coordinator early in the morning. That's it. And then the staff come on at eight to start the day. And we've got one person at night, one person to serve the broth, put the DVD on, and the DVD will be Game Changers. Have you seen the um, documentary game changers about all these top athletes who are going plant-based and getting incredible performances. <coughs> so you see the evening's easy because we want all our staff, what? To go to sleep. See if you go to bed late, you get up late and then you'll miss out on your early morning appointment with God. You'll miss out on your exercise and pff, the day doesn't go well. Did you have a question, Lydia? Well, I wanted to ask how you do that in your um, health center. How we do it in our health center. Yeah. But you don't have every night uh, the game changers on. No, we don't. There's forks over knives. I have always in the evening. There's uh, health matters. There are some very good DVDs. And, and, and that gives the staff a break at night, yeah? Now, we also have one staff, one night a week, we'll do a poultice demonstration. And then another night of the week, I think another staff member will do a, a water demo. So we keep it light at night because um, our guests have a steam sauna at the end of every day. And after a steam sauna, <laughs> you're ready for sleep. So we just keep the evening program light. But what's a delightful thing to show your guests is that every human being has a divine appointment early in the morning with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it's found in Isaiah, I think it's chapter, I don't know if it's chapter 40 verse 5 or chapter 50 verse 4. It's one of those, 50 verse 4. And the Bible says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I may know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. So we have a divine appointment early in the morning. He wakeneth morning by morning. It's there. It's very early in the morning. 
Now the deceiver of souls is going to do everything in his power to prevent you, every human being, from missing that divine appointment. You know what I find? I find this so much that I've got my early morning appointment and ideas flash into my mind like lightning. Just shoo, shoo, shoo. So sometimes I have a bit of pen and paper there and think, wow, that's a good idea. Wow, that's another great idea. That's another great idea. And remember what we've got in that early morning, uh, our inventions. Where do they come from? They come from God. Yes. Solutions to the problems. It's all happening in that very early in the morning. And I think God's got a sense of humor. I know he has. Because I was in uh, uh, Denver, Colorado, you know, the Rocky Mountains. And I was praying in bed. I was kneeling kneeling in bed, praying. And just in my mind, I could see this flashing. So I looked up and there's a window behind the bed and there was a very dark cloud there and lightning was flashing out of it. <laughs> I think God was showing me, yeah, it's early in the morning that those ideas just flash, flash into the mind. So can you see the great deceiver is so effective at robbing people of that early morning appointment. Mm. There is our strength and our power for the day. So when God says, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them, that's what he wants to do. But if we've missed out on that, the, the whole day doesn't, doesn't work that well. You know, when the Bible says, give us this day our daily bread, you know, our mm. spiritual food early in the morning, yes? Now you mentioned that the Lord is waking us up, so sometimes God wakes me up quite early. Yeah. <laughs> but if you said then if you only have six hours, we have then cognitive impairment. But don't you think that the God can compensate it as well? He can, no? I certainly do. And it's six, it's ten nights in a row of okay. six hours. Sometimes. It's ten nights in a row that you'll get, that, you know, it's a, a culmination. And then we read in the Bible that Jesus rose very, very early and, and prayed to his father. That it's, and I certainly do think that God can compensate when, when there is an, a need. I know when I was, uh, see, twice I had babies 80 months apart. And when you've got a baby 80 months apart, you've got a baby, you've got another little baby there. And that's why I used to sleep with my babies because I just got more sleep. <laughs> <laughs> if I slept with him. But if, if, the, if a baby had a cold or then maybe one of the other little ones has got a cold, then I would get about four hours sleep a night. And if I got four hours in one chunk, oh, I just praise God, I could function quite well on that. And I think I could function quite well on that for a few reasons. I think God can compensate. And I also think that it was because if I had four hours, I would just thank him. I'd say, praise God, I can function on four hours. Because I'm up in the rainforest, I don't have any electricity. <laughs> so to cook the breakfast, I have to light the fire in my fuel stove. When I saw the fuel stove around the corner here, I was so excited because they're my favourite stove. <laughs> and our hot water came off the fuel stove. And if you've been awake half the night, you got to get up in the morning because the breakfast, the stove has to be lit and the breakfast has to be done. And, the, and you know what the mother must have the whole time on her face? A smile. That's right, a smile. <laughs> and we'll have a little bit better sleep uh, tomorrow night. So God certainly understands what, what we go through. He, he knows the very hairs are on our heads so he he certainly knows the way that we take and he knows our path and and he will bless that and he is all powerful so he is able well able to compensate so ephesians 3 verse 20 now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think and i know too that he he will empower us but what was interesting is I put my alarm on my phone, which I don't use very much, rarely, only if I have a very early morning flight because I usually have my phone off or not near me. But of course, I had to this night. 
and I had my phone alarm on for 2.45, quarter to three, and then we'd drive out at quarter past three. Well, I woke up at quarter past two. And I said, thank you, Father in heaven, but I think I can have a little bit more of a doze. Mm -hmm. So I just dozed in and out, knowing I'm going to have to get up in the middle. In a minute, you won't have to fall asleep. And then I thought, you know, it's been a while. Oh, it was quarter two. My alarm hadn't gone off. Oh, mm. I put the alarm on for 2.45 p.m. <laughs> I'm not a great mathematician, the best of times, but... <laughs> Oh, but God faithfully woke me. Praise be to God, or I would have been here even later than I got here. <laughs> so God is very faithful. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our trials. He, he can certainly help to compensate. So proper diet, what part, what part does the proper diet play? It, it plays a huge part because the hormones that are released from the pineal gland are all made out of the food that we eat. And it requires amino acids. In fact, our neurotransmitters are made from amino acids. Tomorrow I'm going, we're going to go to the brain and I'm going to show you that one in detail. And we need minerals. Remember, the minerals glue us together. And we need the fats because the fats keep the membrane fluid and supple and able to... Uh, especially your flaxseed and your chia seed. As you'll see when we look at fats, there's a, the um, repelling action in the double bond creates an electromagnetic field between them. So the, the omega-3s are very important in proper brain function. And uh, Neil Nedley in his book Depression A Way Out, he spends quite a bit of time showing the role that omega-3 plays in depression and also the book um, Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill by Udo Rasmus, he also shows the role that the omega-3s play. So there's your walnuts. I think we had walnuts this morning, didn't we? And your um, chia seed and your flax seeds, they are they are very high in the omega-3. And the minerals from our vegetables. Water, our brain's a hydroelectric system. So no hydro, no electricity. So we must keep that brain fully hydrated. And remember one of the things that can inhibit the output of the hormones at night is stress. Stress. So in Isaiah, it's nice to have a few verses for your guests. Isaiah 26 verse 3, Thou will keep him in perfect peace. He whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. And the... The part of the Bible in uh, John chapter 14 where Jesus is explaining the Holy Spirit to his disciples. So John 14, 26, he says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever things I have spoken unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Mm. Not as the world giveth, giveth I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Beautiful verses to show. We have no need to worry or fear. Because perfect love, what does it do to fear? It casts out fear. We have two very famous, uh, a prime minister and a um, president, that are an illustration of what happens when you don't get enough sleep. One is Margaret Thatcher, brilliant mind, brilliant mind. And she boasted on five hours sleep a night. Mm -hmm. She boasted on five hours sleep a night. How did she spend the last 20 years of her life? Dementia. Severe dementia. Mm. She didn't even know who her husband was. And there was one report of when he died and I forget his name, let's call it Stan. And she'd say to her nurse every day, where's Stan? Where's Stan? And her nurse would say, Stan's died. And she'd go into mourning. So they ended up having to not say that to her because she'd go into mourning three or four times a day. Just so sad that such a brilliant mind. Did God, did God plan that? No. Moses, I've just been reading in Patriarchs and Prophets, the last days of Moses and Aaron. 
they're, my, they're brilliant minds. In fact, more brilliant with age. Isn't that what God planned? Did it have something to do with her sleep patterns? They have found that in dementia and Alzheimer's, amyloid plaques, I'll write that for you, amyloid. Amyloid plaques, which are like calcified deposits, build up in the frontal lobe. Now, the frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex is where we make our decisions. This is reason, intellect and judgment and decisions are made here. So what part of the brain does the devil want to take down? Absolutely here. Now, five hours sleep a night. Do you think that was 5 p.m. to 10 p.m.? No. When would it have been? It would have been one or two in the morning. So she was missing out on her cleaning system. Her glymphatic system was unable to clean efficiently because she missed out on the early part of the night where the cleaning system is the busiest. So this is another reason why an hour before midnight is worth two after midnight. Of course, that's also the courier system because it, uh Short memory, uh, hippocampus perhaps was not emptied. Yeah, that's, that's also another, another point. Yeah. But what they have found is that when you sleep eight hours every night, especially the early hours of the night, the cleaning system cleans up any even tiny development of an amyloid plaque. It doesn't develop. Another one is... Um, the president of the United States, what was his name, the movie star? That was a, Ronald Reagan. He boasted on only five hours sleep a night. He said, that's all I need, five hours a night. How did he spend the last 20 years of his life? With severe dementia. I don't know anyone that wants dementia. And I also know that God never meant anyone to have dementia. Have you read about it in the Bible? No, no. no the only one that comes near it is Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. who ate grass for seven grass. years. Yeah. But then he came to his senses. <laughs> then he came to his senses and decided to acknowledge that God was the king of the universe. That was pride. Yeah. That's right, it was pride. <coughs> it was pride. Yeah. According to the chart, uh, chart, we see that dreaming happens most before you wake up. Um, can it be that one dreams unusually much, so that one thinks, hey, uh, I'm dreaming all night long? Thank you. That's right. They can think they're dreaming all night long. But you notice, if you wake up at midnight, rarely do you remember it or even think of a dream. But if you wake up at three, four, five... Um, you, you usually can remember your dreams then. And you'll only remember your dream if you, make up, if you wake up in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are some nights I don't even remember a dream. There are some, some nights. And what I find interesting is my dreams come to me about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and I think, ha, oh, I had a beautiful dream. I mentioned my daughter-in-law that I've had a bit of issue with over her suspecting me not doing what she wants. I had a beautiful dream how she was loving and kind. Oh, don't you love that? (laughs) And we can certainly choose to picture that. And if someone has a nightmare, what's a nightmare? A nightmare is something very troubling to the mind. It's important to look at it and important to make sure that if there's any area there, is forgiveness needed? And Dr. Neil Nedley, he says, any negative thought that comes up, quickly match it with a positive one. Quickly match it with a positive one. It's like the lady that said to me, my mother was an intellectual, my father was an intellectual, he was a professor. She said, um, I was born, they didn't quite know what to do with me, so they had a nurse to help. And then my mother fell pregnant again. So rather than have, um, have a baby and a toddler, she said, I was just put in a nursery because my mother couldn't deal with two. 
And I said, do you know what I want you to picture in your mind? That there was a nurse in that nursery that just loved you. Who couldn't wait to see you come in the door. Who fussed over you, who kissed and cuddled you. That's what I want to picture in the mind. But what if there wasn't? doesn't matter. It's in the mind. Can you see that? It's very simple. If you say it's good, it will be. And if you say it's terrible, it will be. So I love the way Neil Nedley, you might be familiar with him. He's got an excellent book called Proof Positive where he's got all the proof you probably ever need as medical missionaries. That's where I got the information on the pineal gland. But in his book, uh, Depression A Way Out, uh, he, he's got fantastic little links and keys that people can do. And in his book, Depression A Way Out, every, every chapter starts with someone else's story because every story is different. Isn't that true? And some of the people with the most severe depression have had a, uh, have had a gifted life. And some of the people that are the most resilient and happiest people I've met have had the worst history. It's not what happens to us. It's actually what we do with it. So no matter what happens to us, what does God want us to do? He says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Yes? Can you please the name of the author you have just mentioned? Dr. Neil Nedley. Thank you. He's an American. He was in Sweden many years ago. He's an American uh, Seventh day Adventist doctor, and he's got a program he's developed called. Um, well, it's the same name as his book, Depression A Way Out. It's a depression recovery program. It's incredibly effective. effective. Do you think? Am I right? No, you can, you can try both. I think... Well, the other is that you can try both names. You've got a choice. <laughs> Are there any questions before we close up for our break? Yes. Um, for the last 15 years or so, uh, I always go to sleep with uh, the sound of a waterfall. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, very low. Uh, we haven't spoke anything about uh, silence during the night. Is there any... Silence through the night is important, but not always possible. Because there are a lot of people that live in the city. And when I was living in the Bronx, there is no silence. There's sirens, there's screaming, there's yelling. There's <laughs> and so it's not always possible. But that, that can be a great idea, having a, um, having a sound of a waterfall. And that can also drown the other sounds. That is true, that is true. And I love the sound of rain on a tin roof. That's, that's very nice. But other people say, oh, I can't stand that noise. So it's, it's, all, it's all how you see it too. And I also know that when I stay with my son Peter one night, he was living near a railway station. And every time a train went by, I was, whoa, what's that? Oh, that's right, I'm sleeping with Peter and it's a train. Peter didn't even move. So if I... If I continued to live there, what I will find was that I would not wake to the train. And in Australia, we have cicadas. Do you know cicadas? Do you have cicadas here? Oh, when, when cicadas are all coming out of the ground, they're like a little insect, but they have this buzz. And we have guests come and they say, oh, 
how can you bear the sound? We can't even hear it. And then when they mention it, then I hear it. So that tells me too that it's a brain thing too, is you can actually turn the noises on and off. It's like if a baby cries in the night, I'm awake, but my husband doesn't even stir. <laughs> but I think if a helicopter went over the head, he'd go, what was that? <laughs> and I might not stir. So, there, you know, there's a little bit of that. And it's like men and women. And I remember when, I was, when he and I married, I said, my friend Lindy, she had a red dress on. And he said, I don't know what colour a dress was. What car did her husband drive? I said, I don't know what car her husband drove. <laughs> My husband knows which guest drives which car and exactly what type of car it is, and I know that it's a white car or a silver car. So, you know, there's, there's also that difference between men and women.